I was the last guy to get gas for my flight, and I look over to my left, and I see four typhoons over to my left. I, it was just, you know, a, a surreal moment. All right, y'all, welcome back to my arms channel. Okay, today we're checking out something from Forces News. Now, this seems pretty topical, at least at the time of recording, when all the crazy, like, Chinese spy balloon stuff is going down. But this is, like, I guess the largest allied air exercise ever. At least that's what the title says. Um, and I guess it's more specifically focused towards China. So, yeah, I don't know. It should be cool. Again, we've seen a lot of really massive, like, sort of air exercises. And it's always kind of cool to see what sort of scenarios they're actually, you know, like developing and whatnot for these exercises. But I imagine we're probably not going to be seeing like them necessarily engaging any like Chinese spy balloons or something. But it should be cool regardless. Now, of course, you guys can probably tell the uh, the video quality looks a little bit different. So I got a new camera. I'm still trying to work out the angles and whatnot, but I think this is looking pretty good so far so yeah um hopefully you guys uh, appreciate the the quality difference i'm also going to be using this camera for like some of the videos when i'm like out and about on the range and whatnot so yeah at least the the quality should be better especially with like all the crappy lighting we get here in the pacific northwest so yeah this video should be cool let's go ahead and check it out the bright lights and bling of vegas? las vegas but yeah. as revelers risk their dollars on the edge of town war fighters are taking to the skies in Nevada? What the heck? Okay. <laughs> by night and by day, American, Australian and British crews set out on sorties in the biggest air combat training oh, yeah. exercise anywhere in the world. This in is Nevada. Red flag. Damn, My okay. My job is to train the coalition air forces to the most advanced adversary that we possibly can. It's probably the His name was Jabba. Java Hutchinson. The Coalition Air Force. Interesting, that's pretty cool. Advanced adversary that we possibly can. It's probably the most uh, demanding and challenging exercise from an aircrew perspective. Very, very stressful. Okay. And that's the whole point. This huge exercise happens every year, but 2023 has been different. So we're going to find out why. <laughs> the spy balloon. There is Las Vegas. You can see how close we are to the city itself. And over this way... No kidding. This is so weird considering I was just at in Las Vegas for like SHOT Show and whatnot. Now in the Ferris wheel, like the really tall Ferris wheel, you could like see out and the city is pretty massive, but you can like see some of the desert. So I'm wondering if I was able to kind of see where they're training at right now. Of the Nevada desert and today's missions are just beginning. Of all places, like right by Las Vegas for this massive exercise. Damn. Red flag began almost half a century ago when the US military realized from Vietnam that if pilots survived their first 10 missions, the chances were they'd survive the war. Red flag was born Jeez. to simulate those first 10 perilous sorties. Red flag, the most realistic Damn, okay. training That's pretty cool. I didn't know. Is that old? Today, the exercise is bigger than ever. There's now three a year. This is Red Flag 1, and it's huge. So this oh, yeah. is the British flight line. We've got all our typhoons nicely lined up. Oh, Next clean. to us are the Australians. They've brought their four growlers with them. And beyond them are the <laughs> That's US. so awesome. Now, there's around 100 jets here, and this stretches for over a mile. Although the goal remains jets. the same, Jeez. after years of looking eastward, now attention turns to a new... It might be a stupid question, but how does like the the UK and the Aussies get their jets over there? I, is that a dumb question? I, I imagine they fly them over. I don't know how else you would transport a uh, fixed wing aircraft. To be honest, I don't know. I mean, aircraft carrier, but I doubt they do that. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably a dumb question, but <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it, it, it is more complicated than that. Threat. <laughs> red flag scenarios during Red Flag 23-1 are 100% focused on the pacing challenge in China. Uh, we present the blue participants with both offensive and defensive counter problem sets every uh, training period that they're uh, participating in. Nice. The big challenge now is what the Americans call the tyranny of distance. The miles a task force would need to cover just to reach the fight. They could mm -hmm. also be operating over water, not land, and potentially fighting a well-equipped enemy. 
To tackle the tyranny of distance, they've almost tripled the airspace they're training in. It now stretches from Utah, across Nevada, into California, and for the first time over the Pacific Ocean. Oh damn, what are they going to the do there? Involved bring their Maybe aircraft carrier stuff? To the party. And this problem of distance means what the British bring is key. Or hitting some naval targets, that'd be cool. The Voyager is the RAF's air-to-air -air refueling tanker. It's basically a civilian airliner with a few handy military adaptations. Does it, it really two Does it really still have all the seats on the inside? I mean, I don't know if they would ever use it as like a transport aircraft, but I guess if it still has that capability, why not? It is kind of weird though. I, I couldn't imagine they would still leave the seats in. Don't know. Pods for refueling fast jets with an additional center hose for larger aircraft. Oh, that's cool. It can refuel two jets at a time, delivering half a ton of fuel a minute with each jet taking around five minutes to refuel. It complements the U.S. tanker, the KC-135, which uses a single rigid boom and is better for refueling bombers and larger aircraft. Hose is about 99. I've never seen them that close up. And you'll just see the basket tucked up in there, and it'll come out behind the aircraft and just sit in the airflow here. And then the receivers come up with their probes, and then their job is to prod their uh, probes into the basket uh, at about 400 miles an hour. And that's how the babies are made. The effectively a force multiplier, <laughs> enabling aircraft to stay airborne for longer. She's therefore critical to this year's red flag. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it with the videos before where, like, the typhoons were doing, like, that 9,000-mile mission. I think it was, like, 4,500 miles one way and then 4,500 miles back, which is pretty insane. And, of course, they wouldn't be able to do that if they didn't have the in-air refueling. So this is a this is definitely, like, a strategic capability because just like aircraft carriers are strategic as far as moving ships across the Navy, having this sort of capability is absolutely crucial if you want to get some of those long range operations going. So although this, to all intents and purposes, looks exactly like a civilian airliner, we are essentially an international airborne fuel station. We hang out they on the edge the of the seat. So funny. Deep, waiting to refuel the British Typhoons, the US Marine Corps F-35Bs, and oh, the yeah. Australian Air Force, and the US Navy's Growlers. That's okay, freaking so awesome. Expecting. I wonder if they have like a, a list somewhere of all the different types of vehicles or aircraft they've actually refueled. Kind of like how uh, fighter jets have like the uh, the type of aircraft or whatever like that, that they took out in the war. Probably not too applicable nowadays, but yeah, I think that'd be kind of cool. Like all the different types of aircraft they refueled. Uh, <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, and then the second wave, we've got some uh, F-35s coming. They're busy. It is very busy. I mean, these guys are just so busy. I just try not to talk to them. They <laughs> yes, they do. It's not long before That's the first cool. customers arrive. Up front, the mission systems operator controls the refueling. Today, the Voyager Damn, has 50 tons of fuel to deliver to 18 aircraft in around 90 minutes. Meanwhile, That's a the quality job camera. Pilots is to fly straight and level. Dude, their patch is freaking sick. I mean, if you're doing like a massive event like this, you have to have like a cool custom patch made. And level. Very still, very steady, very predictable. Um, we don't want them to be disorientated while they're around the aircraft. We want to provide Smooth. a nice steady platform for them to come and get their, their fuel. Uh, as you can imagine, it's like a big flexible hose. It bounces around <laughs> if there's any uh, bumps or turbulence. Who's so that? It's hard enough as it is, so anything we can do to make it easy for them. Come on them. now. The jets come and formate on the left-hand wing. Um, that's kind of like the holding area. And then two okay. at a time, they'll come one behind each hose. It's like the uh, when you show up to Costco and there's like a line of people trying to get fuel. This is like the aircraft equivalent, which is pretty cool. Again, like this isn't stuff that would like normally appear interesting or like sexy, but it is kind of cool to see and understand how it's done. They'll then connect when they get the green light uh, to say they can take their fuel. When they're finished, they'll disconnect and then they move off to the right hand wing, which is kind of the holding area before they leave. And then they'll climb up above us and head back uh, to their fight. That's so cool. The Voyager is a very critical enabling asset, what we call a high value asset. So what we tend to do is make sure that the Voyager is protected. We don't want the Voyager near the enemy forces and we always want to have blue forces, fighters, in between the Voyager and mm. the enemy. So we would have fighters protecting the Voyager, we'd have fighters up front fighting the enemy, and we'd also probably have fighters on the Voyager refueling as well. Whilst we mm, brought our typhoons call. and tanker, the Australians came with their growlers. The EA-18G growler is an electronic attack aircraft designed to scramble enemy communications. 
It's okay. a very important exercise for Australia. Um, for us, it really includes incorporating into packages of up to 60 or 70 aircraft um, to achieve uh, various mission sets. So I wonder the kind of capabilities that one could actually offer, or if they generally tend to work together and, and kind of like amplify the effects that they can actually have when they have multiple aircraft. So working with 60, I don't know, it makes it sound like they kind of have to have a combined effort to actually have like any real effects on some of those systems. But I don't know how they would train it in this sort of environment. Maybe they would have like some sort of electronic warfare kind of target or like cell dedicated to, you know, have these guys, you know, let these guys have some fun. But I don't know. Of course, if you guys have any insight, definitely let me know. And of course, if you're a pilot that took part in this, let me know how that was because it looks like a really, really cool time. A lot of cool networking for sure, especially since you're right by Vegas. Our task or our mission set is really to enhance the survivability and lethality of uh, the Joint and Coalition Force. And we do that by denying or degrading or deceiving uh, enemy communications or RF equipment to make sure that the, the Typhoons, for example, can achieve their mission set. Oh, yeah, it's not just the scenario putting the visitors to the test. The cold winter desert also has its challenges. Well, it's used to being in such warm climate, and now it's like freezing, and we're just like, oh, what is it going to do now? <laughs> we always figure it out. It's great. It <laughs> looks simple, but they're really not. There is so much design that's gone into them, and so much information that you've got to learn about it to be so able cool. to fix it or troubleshoot it. As the Allies evolve, so too does the enemy. To keep mean? coalition forces on their toes, Nellis Air Base has a unit of resident buddies. Their job Hell is yeah. to provide red air. In other words, to get amongst the blue oh, friendly nice. forces and do all they can to disrupt them. Like Very cool. Yeah, whenever we go through the uh, JRTC, which is like a month long training exercise down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, you have like red air. And that's pretty cool to actually like especially me as a recon element kind of maneuvering and all of a sudden you have this red air coming above like it definitely puts you on your toes and of course it's more realistic to what you would actually expect in sort of a peer-to-peer -peer conflict can to disrupt them last year they became even more lethal when they were joined by a new squadron of f-35s headed up by commander norso damn so red f-35 red flag it's a challenge. Uh, That's to, pretty to intense. A certain degree. Uh, I think the baseline you start that um, start as your, your best fighter pilot that you can be is the is the absolute baseline, uh, mm. whether from the enemy or from the good side. But then now you have to put yourself from in the mindset of the enemy that you're yeah, yeah. you're hitting the, the the missile launch the simulated missile launch button against your friends uh, there, and you you can't be afraid to do that because any hesitation. Mm. Uh, in doing that means that your friend is not getting the best training that they could possibly get. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I gotta say, those guys definitely take it pretty serious from what I've seen. Like, every time we have, like, any sort of Op 4, like, dedicated Op 4, or any sort of, like, red element like this, they always really understand, like, the TTPs, the, the SOPs, like, standard operating procedures of those adversarial forces, and they use their ta those tactics against you, which, of course, provides, like, the best sort of training because they're using tactics that you would actually expect from that, that real-life force. Another day, another mission. They need to be snug so that um, the when you're pulling G in the aircraft, <laughs> the, uh, these pants inflate and squeeze squeeze the blood back up to your torso and into your, into your brain so you, you don't lose consciousness under high G. They need to be oh. tightly fitted. Um, after a few weeks in America, um, is a challenge to get on. <laughs> Do you have to psych yourself up for going out for a sortie? Uh, you certainly need to put yourself in, a, in, a, in the right frame of mind. Um, also, they have rock music in here, which, yeah, yeah. which helps as well. Yeah, yeah. Get into the mood, clear the mind. Yeah, out here you get a uh, kind of a big match mindset. So, um, with so many people watching as well, yeah, um, you don't want to let each other down, and you want to give the best, best performance you can. So, absolutely, <laughs> uh, well, I definitely still get nervous. Oh yeah, did it, did the pilots are so the chill. And the Australians as well, at all? No, not at all. We just want to uh, get the bad guys. Nice. Black Hawks provide cover as the B-52 strategic bombers depart first, then the tankers... Oh, damn. That was actually the... Uh, I think that was the first wheel right back there. They're really that close? Dude, no kidding. So, yeah, that is the uh, the Ferris wheel right there. They are actually really freaking close. I'm sure I was able to see this when I was actually on the Ferris wheel. If you guys want to go and check out the uh, SHOT Show vlog, you might actually see this uh, this airstrip here. Depart first, then the tankers... Fast jets follow. 
There seems little doubt amongst yeah, yeah. the 3,000 or so deployed that Red Flag is working. You said you'd, nice. you'd only died once. Is that... <laughs> yes, so uh, oh, do we have to talk rate? about that? <laughs> <laughs> it was my first mission. I was taken aback by the, the aggressiveness of our adversary. I haven't died since, so uh, I learned my lesson, I like think. Nice. I was the last guy to get hey, from at least it's in training. I look over to my left and I see four typhoons over to my left. I, it was just, you know, a, a surreal moment. I like couldn't believe that I, like, whatever choices in my life brought me to that moment. It was, it was beautiful to see. I feel exactly uh, yeah. where I want to be, you know. It just feels right being here. They're just admiring their 35s too. As red That's flag draws so to a close, coalition forces prepare for the long journey home, and Nevada looks to future red flags, which may be conducted entirely at sea. Panicking Forces mm. News, Nellis Air Base, Nevada. Dude, that was freaking sick. And again, so trippy, it was like right, right video, there, don't like right next to Las Vegas. Now again, if y'all have ever worked with pilots, you will understand like they are some of the most chill people ever. But again, they're so insanely proficient at what they do. Like, I'm definitely a light infantry guy. I, it's so weird to think that like my entire job is focused on being inside this like machine and trying to you know work with the machine to to do my job. It it's kind of like mind blowing for me, especially when they're in the air doing these insane maneuvers and stuff. Yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for for pilots and and how they can kind of keep their calm and, and be so chill when they have like such an insane job like that. But it is a very cool thing to to be a pilot. So of course, if we do have any pilots watching this, let me know your experiences. Of course, if you got to do any other sort of like allied or coalition training, let me know how that was. But I know they said this was kind of focused on China. And I imagine they're, they're probably not gonna go into the specifics of what sort of exercises they're actually training, you know, for, you know, very obvious reasons, I, I guess. Uh, but it is kind of cool that they actually have a focus like that. And that's a very real threat out there, especially, you know, with, with what's going on, kind of like all the random stuff that we see, stuff with like Taiwan, specifically the South China Sea, and then like the, uh, the crazy weird spy balloons. Yeah, so I think it's a very real threat, and I think it's a very pertinent thing to be focusing on right now. But yeah, it's kind of interesting to also be able to look at like Ukraine combat footage and see some of like the, not necessarily the dog fights, but see some of like the, uh, the actual footage from the pilots to get some perspective as far as how that's actually working over in Ukraine. So it's kind of interesting to see like the real world perspective happening over there, but then also see what kind of training focus they're doing here. But it must be really freaking fun for the pilots to be working with all these different aircraft. And you probably have like some favorite aircraft that you don't necessarily work with. So the the off chance you could actually work with those aircraft in, in an environment like this, whenever they actually become a pilot and do this coalition training, sounds pretty freaking cool, pretty exciting for them as well. But it looks like a massive exercise, a lot of aircraft, a lot of people, and just a cool location. So it looks like pretty fun overall, but also some very solid training. Let me know what you guys think. Of course, if you guys like the video, hit the thumbs up. Hopefully you guys uh, appreciate the uh, the new camera quality. I think it looks pretty cool. It looks like a little too fancy and cinematic for my channel, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Of course, hit that thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. Comment and let me know what you think. But that is it for this video. I'll see you on the next one.